Hey, good morning, everybody. It's great to have you guys here. Great to have Pastor Gary back with us. Yesterday, he was at Pepperdine because his daughter Kylie graduated. So they got two. Yeah. Two Pepperdine grads there. But hey, as Pastor Gary was sharing, uh, it is a special week. And you guys probably noticed all the different things going on in the lobby. Uh, we hope you guys would spend some time afterwards just checking some of those things out. Uh, again, this is our, our Illuminate Missions Week. And this is, I believe, it's the fourth year we've had it. Um, and I wanted to thank you. Before we kind of get into everything, I wanted to thank all of you. Uh, it's incredible the amount of donations. Everything you see out there on those auction tables has been donated uh, by you guys, by our, our, our small groups, um, by just different individuals, the businesses out there. And all these proceeds are going towards sending our mission missionaries out. And we have, I believe, about six teams going out this summer, uh, roughly 30 plus missionaries that will be heading out to places like East Asia, Uganda, Japan. And so we're really excited. And we wanted to bring a few of them up here uh, just to share a little bit of their stories with you. We think they have some stories that are going to encourage you. Uh, we think they have some stories that are really just going to kind of show how God's been moving in their lives and just in the lives of the church here. So they'll be out in just a moment. Let me open us up in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we uh, thank you so much uh, just for the chance to be here uh, this morning, Lord. Uh, again, a special morning in the fact that you know, we're really just kind of putting the spotlight on missions. But missions is something, uh, for the, it's not just one weekend of the year. Really, you've given us this call to spread the gospel here in the South Bay, all over this country and overseas, uh, every day, Lord. Uh, that is very clear in the Word of God, Lord, that you just have a heart for everyone. As much as you love us, you love people all over the globe. And Lord, I think we just want to be a church that's available, that's willing to go wherever it is that you're calling us to go, Lord. And so I pray, Father, that uh, as we hear from some of our missionaries, um, as we really dive into Scripture and what this looks like, that you would speak to us, that you would meet us exactly where we're at. Uh, I know missions can be kind of a scary thing, thinking of going overseas into a place that's unknown, uh, into a culture that we don't know much about. Uh, Father, but if you call us, you'll equip us, Lord. So we love you. We praise you. We pray all this brings you glory. And pray all this in your precious name, Father. Amen. Well, I wanted to introduce you to a couple of our, our missionary team members that will be heading out to summer. This is Jason Kamimori right here. I've known Jason uh, for quite a while. He'll be heading to uh, Chiba, Japan. And I believe we have uh, their team, a picture of their team up there we wanted to show you. Um, Jason's one of our co-leaders. Starting off on the left there, we have uh, Brent. Uh, we have Francis. Uh, Sharon Lee, she's one of the co-leaders of the team. Uh, right next to her is Kyle Ogata, Cole Kawashiri, Lauren Chun, Scott Hamada, and of course, Jason himself. And this is uh, William Morris. William will be heading to Uganda with Loving One by One Ministry. I think we have a picture of that team as well. Uh, up on the top, uh, back left row, we have uh, Linda and Andrew Yee. We have Kay Roberts. Uh, on the back right, we have uh, Sydney Ma. That's actually Pastor Greg's dad who will be heading out there. Right below is Kathy. Um, Pastor Greg's mom, Sylvia, will be going as well. In the middle is Laura Shishido. We have William. And on the left there is Sammy. And so that team is pretty amazing. I believe William's probably the youngest one from South Bay, going 23 all the way to early 70s. Uh, so we have quite a range of people heading out to Uganda. Um, but Jason, you know, you, again, you'll be heading out to Shiba, Japan, serving there. What will you guys be doing out there this summer? Yeah, so first of all, I'm excited, grateful to be going to Japan for the first time. Arigato gozaimasu. Wow, not bad, not bad. Yeah, I, I know Pastor Gary is cringing out there somewhere because he thinks my pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> but at least I didn't say karaoke. Okay. So. okay. <laughs> but um, our team will be headed to Budo University. And what's interesting about this college is that it specializes in um, martial arts and sports. So we'll be spending time connecting with and building relationships with the students there. Um, we'll do that by playing sports with them. Uh, we'll be in the classrooms helping them teach English. We're going to spend some time in the school cafeteria, just having lunch with them, getting to know them better. And we're hoping to build relationships with them so that we can invite them to this event that'll take place at the end of the week. And we're gonna cook them an American meal. We will just hang out, have fun with them outside of the um, school setting. And they're gonna have an opportunity to hear some worship music mm. and also um, a message on the gospel for the first time for probably wow. many of them. Yeah. Um, our goal while we're there is to um, try to connect these students with um, Daisuke and Cheryl. They're the local ministry leaders um, who can continue to build those relationships and and hopefully um, help lead them to a relationship with Christ. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, he mentioned Daisuke and Cheryl. You might have seen them here usually uh, once a year. They, we have a homestay program, and you'll see some of the students coming here. You guys will open up your homes to them for those few weeks. And so there's someone we've just been partnering with for a few years now. So as Jason will be in this highly developed country of Japan, but a place that is uh, really desperately lacking the gospel, William will be heading someplace completely different to Uganda, where there is just incredible physical needs there. So what will you guys be doing on that trip, William? 
Yeah, next month we're already heading to Uganda. It's coming up so quick. And we're going to go and meet a lot of the physical needs of the people there, including mm -hmm. the pop-up medical clinics that mm -hmm. we'll be doing. Mm -hmm. And we're also just going to go and just love on these people and spend time with him, um, spend time with them. For example, at uh, homes for cancer patients or mm -hmm. schools for kids mm -hmm. with these disabilities and uh, at these hospitals. So I'm, I'm really excited. And it's my first time going, so I'm not entirely sure what to expect, but I'm excited. That's great. I mean, I've had the chance to uh, head on those trips a few times before, and William, it's it's incredible. I think you, you see the people there, and, and the gospel is, is prevalent in, in Uganda, uh, but you just see people who are really suffering, who, who are lacking a lot of things that hopefully we can come and just walk alongside them and help bring. I know this is your first time in Uganda, but it's not your first time in Africa. You were actually in, in Kenya last year, uh, so what was, what was that going on? What was going on in that country? Yeah, at the end of last year, I spent time in Kenya with an environmental Christian organization. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing scientific research, uh, community conservation, and environmental education for the children there. And so I was doing what's called an environmental mission. And so it's a very new term, and so most of you probably haven't heard of it. But what it does is takes the ministering and church planning aspect of missions and mixes that with caring for God's creation. And so, you know, the two greatest commandments in the Bible are to love God and to love our neighbors. And one of the ways we can love God and worship him is by caring for the earth that he's created. Mm -hmm. And what better way is there to love our neighbors than to, to care for the land they live on, to make sure they have enough food to eat, mm -hmm. that they have clean water to drink and fresh air to breathe. You know, I know science, you know, a lot of times we see those two things, science and, and just the, the gospel not really always going hand in hand. But I know science has been something that's been on your heart from college on up. You know, how did you get involved in this? How did you get open up the door to environmental missions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, growing up, I always loved science. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to college, I decided to major in environmental science. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty tough. I'd often be the only Christian in these science classes. And then at church, I'd be the only Christian with a science major. And so it was really hard for me to find a way to put my passion and my faith together. And it was true until I graduated. And the church I was going to did a mission school. Mm. And someone came who was an environmental missionary. And just hearing them talk about, you know, what they do and why it's important mm. and how it relates to the gospel mm. really, really struck me. And it was like this light bulb went off in my head. And after hearing about that, I was like, this is, this is something I really want to mm. try and do. So as William is looking at this, uh, maybe as a long-term missionary, right? This is something he's hoping God will open up the door to. I know he's looking into different avenues for that. Uh, you know, Jason, your path has been a little bit different. You know, I know uh, we actually had the chance to serve together in Uganda about five years ago. Um, you know, as you've looked at that, how has God kind of revealed his heart for the nations just in your journey? And when I went on that mission trip five years ago, uh, that was the first mission trip mm -hmm. I've been on. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about doing missions before that. Um, so I was pretty nervous about going to Africa. Um, in my mind, I pictured Africa to be this hot, this dirty place, no running water, no electricity, uh, maybe we'd be living in huts. Um, and on top of that, we were warned about black mambas, witch doctors, and mosquitoes that could kill us. But yeah, don't worry, William, you're going to be just fine. You have, you have God on your side. <laughs> So um, this was just something that was completely out of my comfort zone. Um, I decided to go because people would tell me that it would be life-changing. Uh, I'm not sure how or why, um, so I just went. And it turned out to be an amazing experience. And I think um, having to rely on God so much is to help me navigate through these unfamiliar territory, um, I think it allowed me to just experience his presence and his love um, in a greater way than I had before. And I think I saw that through my teammates, the support I received with them. Um, I enjoyed just building the relationships with them and just going through this experience together. Mm. Um, and especially just the times we were able to um, just connect and interact with the kids, you know, with, whether it was some of the things you mentioned, going to the hospital with these severely um, um, injured or mm. burned um, mm. children, they really, a lot of them didn't have anybody there, or going to the, the school with the disabled kids, or the villages where you just have hundreds of kids um, that are just hanging all over you. And I think God used those opportunities to soften my heart. And it's interesting, because as we were there to serve and just love on the people there, I felt like we are the one that were being blessed, and that we're being ministered to, because you know, what I saw was that this genuine joy and gratitude just flowing through the believers there. Um, despite not really having much of anything or being in such poor conditions, according to our standards, 
you know, I admired just how strong their faith was yeah. and how strong their love for God was. So um, I think coming back, I definitely w w was changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't feel like I was called to be a missionary. <laughs> um, but I did feel compelled to help support those ministries and the missionaries that were doing that work. Yeah. And support, you know, I mean, we, we can't all go. Uh, you know, God's not always going to open up that door for us to go. But support, just like you guys are doing here this weekend by helping out out there, just by being here uh, this morning is so important as well. But, you know, you, you were in Uganda, Jason, and then five years later now there's this opportunity to go to Japan, very different places. You know, how did you get there and how did this door open up for you? Yeah, so it was about a year ago that I went to um, Engage Global. Mm -hmm. it's a, it was a four-day missions training in Minneapolis. I went with um, seven other people from my life group mm -hmm. um, and, and some other very cool people from our church. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that that was just very eye-opening because um, what I learned was that there were over 7,000 people groups or 40% of the world's population that was considered unreached. Mm. And unreached means that there were less than 2% um, evangelical Christians in these people groups. S and some of them had no Christians at all. So there's not enough Christians there to be able to spread the gospel mm. um, unless more Christians go to those places. And another thing that we are told is only something like 10% of the resources going to missions go to these mm -hmm. unreached areas. Mm -hmm. So that was very concerning to me. Um, it was also just made me curious to learn more about missions. So then the next thing I did was I took a, a perspectives course, which is a missions um, class. And you know, someone told me that it was going to rock my world, and it did. You know, for the next 15 weeks, God just showed me the urgency um, of His purpose and plan to reach the nations and to reach all people, and. Something interesting happened where my focus shifted from, from me and trying to figure out what is my purpose in life mm. to trying to understand God's purpose for the world and then asking, you know, how can I be a part of that? Mm. So I think um, one of the things that he did was he put Japan on my heart. Um, Japan's one of the largest unreached people groups in the world. And so I've been just trying to learn um, I've been taking Japanese classes. You heard my Japanese, right? It's impressive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been trying to learn as much about the, the culture as I can um, by watching Terrace House. <laughs> and I think it's, it's amazing what God has been doing. You know, as soon as I was willing to say yes to be a part of his purpose, um, all these opportunities <laughs> started um, opening up. Mm -hmm. And I was invited uh, to go to the Urbana Missions Conference in mm -hmm. December. Then I was accepted to go to uh, Japan on the VBS team. Um, and now, instead of that, I'll be going to Chiba. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm very thankful that you're pouring into the uh, Japanese culture with Terra Salsa. That sounds like a great use of time. So, you know, thank you for, for, for doing that, uh, Jason. But, you know, I think one thing you shared uh, that really struck me was, you know, there was this perspective change, right? There was, you know, what is, what is my life about? You know, what, what, what am I going to end up doing? Um, and all of a sudden, kind of seeing God's purpose and God's heart uh, just to get the gospel out to as many places as we can and asking, you know, how, how can I be a part of that? And I think that's something that God's calling each of us uh, to really think and, and to really figure out, you know, what piece of the puzzle do we fill? And I know for you, William, uh, you're looking at these mission opportunities. You've had a chance to go on a few. You're looking at that maybe as something you want to dedicate your life to. You know, what specific ways have you seen Jesus kind of work in this area of your life? Yeah, I think, you know, growing up, I always had a heart for helping people and just this heart for serving God. Mm -hmm. And going on these missions has been just such a tangible way mm -hmm. to, to show uh, my faith and my love for God. It helps, you know, meet those sp spiritual and physical needs, both, not just one or the other. The Bible talks about having faith and deeds. Mm -hmm. So I really want to try and intertwine those both. And it's just um, living that holistic faith that, you know, Jesus is, is asking us to. And I think that uh, especially for me, loving the environment, that that has been such a way to witness to people mm. that uh, has struck me in unexpected ways. And one of the ways that it, it really did that in Kenya, and this past week I got back from Indonesia, was just picking up trash. Mm. And, you know, you're in these countries and you see 
trash along the road or in the waterways or on the beach. And so we would just go out there and just not say anything and just, you know, start picking it up. You know, otherwise this trash, it might be there for hundreds of years, if not longer, you know. And so it doesn't take very long before people start to look at us funny and say, hey, what are you, what are these foreigners? What are these guys doing here? And eventually someone gets brave enough to, to come up to us mm -hmm. and say, hey, what, what are you doing? Like, why, why do you care about us and why are you doing this? And wow, what a, what a good opportunity to just be like, well, we're Christians and, you know, we believe this is God's earth and that he loves it and we're supposed to take care of it. And we believe that he loves you and we want to help take care of you by helping mm -hmm. to clean this up. And people are always so just struck by that, that we would, that we don't know anything about them. We've never met them before, but because, you know, we love God and we love them that we want to take the time out of our day and help. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget in Kenya, there was, uh, we do a weekly beach cleanup. So every Friday we'd go out. And there was always this one old man who would come and help us. And so it's, it's really hot in Kenya, like 90 degrees, the sun's beating down, like the elderly people are usually inside, like where it's cooler. Mm -hmm. But he would come out every single time. He knew we were out there because he, he loved what we were doing and he wanted to, to help us clean up his country. And I think that's something that a lot of people um, overseas have that we don't, is a sense of place and being rooted in where they are and loving their mm -hmm. land. And so I think that um, going over there and showing we care about the same thing is just an amazing way to witness and show that we really love our neighbors. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you're talking about just pick, something simple, picking up a piece of trash, right? You know, how God can use that uh, just to connect you with other people in, in foreign lands. And man, you know, I look at him, he's 23 and, and kind of having a heart that's open to go long term. And I know when I was 23, that was, there was no way. Just that that wasn't, I love the Lord, but that wasn't a door that I was willing to uh, really look into and pursue. Uh, so I imagine as you're looking at this, that there's probably a lot of fears or some obstacles. You know, I just think, you know, where is he going to bring you? Where are you going to live? Just finances. What are some of the, the obstacles and fears that you've been facing with this? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think the biggest obstacle for me originally was just trying to live by my own plans. Hmm. You know, after finishing up school, I wanted to go to grad school and I had these internships lined up and all these things. And, you know, it was just closed doors everywhere. And I was getting frustrated. I was hmm. like, okay, God, you know what? Maybe I need to stop trying what I want and, you know, go, go to what you want. So I was thinking back to the environmental missionary I heard and everything, and I said, okay, you know what, I'll take this leap of faith. And so I decided to get on this plane and fly 10,000 miles away from home over to Kenya, uh, where I don't know a single person. I don't know what I was thinking. But I found a sense of community there and fellowship with the Christians who were there. Um, you know, I'm going to a totally different culture, but I, I was met with um, a similar faith. And so it really felt uh, like a family there. And first where I was feeling frustration with God for not being able to follow my own plans, I was, I was feeling at peace. And I just really felt God's presence mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. in his creation, just going on walks along the beach or in the forest or all these things, I felt, I felt God's presence in a way that I hadn't in such a really long time. And what it really showed me is that um, God isn't asking for our understanding for his plans, but he is asking for our obedience. And so, you know, looking back, I think that was, that was something that really got in my mm -hmm. way was what I wanted instead of focusing on what God wanted. And the other kind of fear obstacle, as I've been doing these environmental missions, is push back a little bit from other people who are Christians, mm -hmm. who, you know, don't believe or don't think that, um, you know, caring for the earth is part of, part of our faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the Bible, God created a garden and he created gardeners, and mm -hmm. we're supposed to take care of what he created. And so I... I think that the, the main thing, yeah, has just been giving up my own plans has really given me a sense of peace. Yeah, I've, I've been able to spend time with you a little bit, William, uh, and him just sharing his heart and, and how God's really put this there uh, to look at the environment. You know, we were looking through scriptures, and, you know, it's always there. You see it in scripture, but then when you have the pieces connected, it kind of opens up your eyes, and you see, man, yeah, God has given us this land, right? And, and are, we, are we taking care of it the way that we should uh, for our generation, for generations to come? Uh, so that's something really encouraging seeing William uh, dive into. And it's our hopes maybe we can send a team someday with people who have a heart for that, something we're looking into. I know for you, Jason, as you're getting ready to leave for Japan, uh, you know, there's some fair obstacles, you know, co-leading a team as well. What, what kind of things have you been facing? I definitely have some doubts and question, you know, why pick me to help lead this team? Mm -hmm. And, you know, first of all, I have to tell you that every time I'm asked to do these things, I feel like it's at the last minute. <laughs> so it makes me believe that Everybody else said no. Um, but, you know, some of the thoughts I wrestle with are, you know, I'm not experienced enough in missions. I've never led a missions team. 
I'm too old, I've never been a parent, so how am I gonna connect with and relate to and lead college students? Um, so there's definitely a lot of fears and I start comparing myself to others who I think you know would be more qualified and in fact I gave you guys a few names of people to ask but apparently they're not available right <laughs> um, but I know that these doubts and fears that I have that they're they're just excuses and they're lies and so I just need to learn to um, just trust God with everything uh, I promise you Jason you were after the half, first half dozen, you were right there. You're like right there uh, to lead that team. So, so thanks for, for being available to that. Uh, you know, you talked about qualifications, and I know that's something uh, I myself and a lot of us have felt before. You know, am I qualified to, to, to go overseas? You know, I don't know anything about this culture. I don't know the language. What would I do? Am I useful, God? Um, you know, I'm reminded of that quote that we've heard, you know, before, that, that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And I think about that, and you see that all throughout Scripture, you know, from the Old Testament, looking at people like Abraham and Moses into the New Testament with the, with the disciples. And, you know, would these be the people that were the most qualified, uh, that were head and shoulders above everyone else? Or was God qual asking the people to go uh, that were just available and they had a heart so that when God used them and they did incredible things in his name, there was no doubt who the glory went to. And I see that here uh, with Jason. You know, just you know, one more question for you guys. Uh, you know, as we look at this, we, this mission process, sometimes we look at it as just being a, a couple-week trip, right? Maybe it's two or three weeks. Maybe it's longer than that. Um, but there's so much that God's doing. You know, there's this whole preparation process that maybe we're not even aware of uh, as God prepares us to go on these trips. Then there's the time there in the field. And then it doesn't stop when you get back. It doesn't end the moment you touch back down from Japan and Uganda, that God really uses this sometimes as a springboard to other things that he's calling you to do. And so, uh, Jason, as you look at this, is there anything you're hoping comes out of your time in Japan? Um, I haven't really thought about it, and it's kind of scary to think, of, uh, think about that. But, um, you know, I want to be available to whatever God calls me to. Mm -hmm. So whether it's go back to Japan, stay in Japan, um, go somewhere completely different. I want to be open to those opportunities um, and just always be willing to say yes. How about for you, Will? Yeah, I think after spending time with people and having these cross-cultural experiences, other countries, other lands, it's just really reinforced to me that this is, this is what I think that my calling is and what I want to spend my life doing. And, you know, there is uncertainty for me because it's so niche and it's, it's such a new thing. Mm. But it's also what excites me about being on the frontier of it and, you know, to show people that this is really an issue that's close to God's heart. And that if there's people out there who care about the environment or science or different things, that there's kingdom work to be done in that. You know, I think about uh, Pastor Greg, I remember him saying this, that, uh, you know, we go on these short-term trips, right? And he was saying, you know, short-term trips lead to long-term hearts. Uh, you know, once you go short-term and, and you're in the culture and you see the people and God opens up your eyes, he builds that heart, possibly the long-term, uh, to go there. And so thank you guys for sharing. I know it's not easy getting up here, kind of sharing some of your story. But, you know, just in closing, I, I see these two guys and, and I see similar hearts, but very two different tracks. You know, I, I look at William as someone who who's just has a passion for science, something that he learned in school, how God immediately is taking this and using it uh, in ways to reach people. I see Jason, someone who over time, God has developed your heart and opened you up and you're available, whether it's Uganda, Japan, who knows what that'll look like in the future. Uh, but Jason's just someone that we really value here. He leads in so many different ways. Um, but I think what encouragement to us, you know, at the end of the day, whatever our track looks like, he's just looking for an open heart to be a part of his purpose. And, you know, we are, we're sending a couple teams to Japan as well uh, to teach VBS, you know, Vacation Bible School. Pastor Gary mentioned that a little earlier. That's coming up in a few months. That's something we've been able to do year in, year out here at the church. We're so thankful for how God uses that. And now, man, opening up the door, we could take that to Japan. And so we have a couple teams that will be heading out there to serve just to teach the little ones. Uh, we put a video together so we can give you a little idea of what that looks like. So take a look at the screen. I've been thinking about going to mission trip for a while. But I never knew what kind or where to go. I heard that our church was going to take a team to Japan to do VBS. And after hearing about this and listening to the amazing experiences from people who went last year, I knew this would be the perfect trip. I think it's a country that's been deep-rooted in their their major religions over the years and so they already have a sense of harmony and uh, conformity that they've grown up with for years and so for us to bring it over there I feel like it's a big challenge. I always loved doing BBS. I was shocked when I found out that Japan had less than 1% of Christians. After I heard about the Japan mission trip from last year, I knew I had to go. It's not just those who are able to go and be in the midst of a new culture and 
teach about Jesus, it takes those back at home in our churches who can pray for us, provide the finances, and just be encouragers. Uh, we have been meeting weekly on this since the two teams were formed. It would be very similar to the VBS we have here. So we're going to condense that and take that over to Japan. And also we're going to do a mommy and me class and a parenting program. word is going to make a difference in these children's lives, whether we see it in the days that we're in Japan or whether we never see it. We can trust Him that it will grow a heart for Him. So that's a little look at our Japan VBS teams. Uh, Danny, you saw him in that video. He actually put that together for us. And so, man, we're really excited. You, you see those faces and you just realize, man, these kids, uh, they're getting to learn about Jesus, maybe for the first time in their lives. Man, we're a worthy uh, investment to be able to send teams. We're hoping that's something that continues to grow in the years to come. Yeah, as, as Jason mentioned, uh, Japan is an unreached people group. It's hard to believe a population that large and, and yet less than 2% uh, know Christ. And another area that we're heading to uh, this summer that is an unreached people group is East Asia. And I know a lot of people may ask, you know, East Asia, why do we call it East Asia? What country specifically is that? You know, there's a reason why we refer to it that way, and that's because uh, the gospel is not welcome there um, by the government. And so to protect the missionaries that are there, we call it East Asia. I know it's a little vague, but we'll be sending a team there as well. We have, we have a picture of them. There's three of them. That's uh, Greg on the left, Priscilla in the middle, and Theo there on the right. They're joining a team of, of other believers coming from uh, all over the country. And uh, to tell you a little bit about their trip is they're partnering with some long-term workers who are already there. Uh, they're already on, on the ground there helping out with uh, different ethnic minority communities. And they'll be teaching an annual English uh, course, uh, a camp really, uh, to roughly about 60, uh, I believe it's middle school and uh, high school students. And so they just want to share as, as, as best as they can. And these are children and families that they're serving. They're from a very large uh, ethnic minority group. Uh, in particular, they don't really have access to any churches. They don't really have access to the Word of God. And so they're bringing it to an area that, that really desperately needs that. And we may not hear about this area much in the news unless we're really intentional about it, but there's a lot going on there. Uh, there's a lot of persecution from the government uh, for the local churches and for the pastors. They're being harassed constantly. Uh, so pre please pray for God's mercy uh, upon these people, for the few workers that are there, um, that they wouldn't be imprisoned uh, due to their faith, uh, to their religious beliefs. And pray for our team as well. You know, we, we, I think what was one of the things as, as God opens up doors is, is sending people to areas that are dangerous, you know, and that was hard as a church, you know, feeling responsible for the people that we have, but also being willing, hey, this area needs to know the word of God. And so these people have willing hearts. So please pray for, for Theo, for Priscilla, for Greg. We have one other actually college student who's actually heading out to East Asia. We found out about this uh, this past week. This is Jordan Liu. Uh, he's going uh, with uh, Cal State Fullerton uh, through the uh, Epic Ministry. And so please pray for him as well. He'll be leaving this week. They'll be out there for three weeks. Kind of a similar game plan uh, as our team, uh, just to be able to spread the gospel with some of the, uh, the current missionaries that are working out there. So please keep them in your prayers. You know, as I look at Jordan, uh, you know, I see this young guy. Uh, I used to be his middle school advisor, and I just see his heart, you know, willing to go out. And, I, you know, it made me think about an experience I had with a lot of college students. Uh, this was back in December of 2015 uh, at this Urbana Missions Conference that took place in St. Louis. And you may think, well, that was only four years ago, Dave. You weren't in college. No, I wasn't in college at that point. Um, I was actually uh, leading a team of, of, middle, of actually um, young adults and, and some of our students that were coming here from the church. And uh, it, it's, it's crazy being there. You know, you're there. Uh, these college students and leaders are coming literally from all over the globe to this conference. And something I experienced there, it really deeply impacted me. Um, one of my favorite speakers was, was getting ready to share there, uh, David Platt. You guys might have heard him before. I know Pastor Gary, Pastor Greg will, will reference him. We just really appreciate the passion and the heart in which he shares uh, the Word of God. And so I want you guys just to imagine, you're there, you're in this football stadium. There's 15,000 people there, and there's just this energy. There's like this buzz, and everybody just has missions on their heart. You know, everybody's so pumped up. 
Um, you, you guys, if you're around young people, you kind of just get that energy and that feel. And so we're there, David Platt's getting ready to share the morning session. And, you know, I feel like at that point, any direction people give us, we're ready to run through a brick wall for God. You know, you're, you're so fired up. And we're thinking that's exactly what David Platt's going to do. He's going to give this charge for missions. He's going to rally the troops, you know, send us all out all over the world. We're ready to go. But very much, uh, he went in the opposite direction. And I'll never forget his words. He just started off his message with just a very, very simple question. He asked, does your heart belong to Jesus? Does your heart belong to Jesus? And he went on to say, some of you here are trying to manufacture a heart for missions, but you're missing a heart for Christ. And I remember just listening to that and letting that sink in. It wasn't just there in that message, but when I got back to the hotel and I was just looking through my notes, uh, and those words, it, it hit me so deeply uh, because it made me reassess why I wanted to go on a mission trip in the first place. It actually made me reassess my motivation for a lot of the things I was doing. And I wanted to pose that question. We just have a few minutes to share this morning, but I wanted to pose that question to each of you here. Does your heart belong to Jesus? And, you know, I'm not asking, you know, if there was some point in your life that you said a prayer and you asked God into your life. I'm not asking how involved you are here at the church. I'm not asking how many small groups that you attend or that you lead. I'm not asking how often you pray before you eat. I'm not even asking how many missionary trips you've been on. But I'm asking, does your heart truly and genuinely belong to Christ? And as I asked that, you know, we come to weekends like this, like Illuminate, and maybe we're encouraged. You know, we hear some of the missionaries sharing. We see the things that are going on. We're encouraged. Um, but if we're honest with ourselves, because I know I've felt this before, you know, we have no motivation to go anywhere in the world to share the gospel. It's definitely not overseas, maybe not in our workplace, not even in our own home. And I know this because I've experienced this before. I've had this faith in Christ, and there's been times where I just, I just express that when I'm here in these walls at church because it's safe and I'm with people who are like-minded. And I don't really share that when I'm out in the workplace, when I'm out there in the world. And I just feel so unmotivated. Uh, and I wonder, why is that, God? Why do I have uh, just no desire to want to share the Word of God? Like, it's good. I have it here in my heart, but... I don't know why it's such a trial to be able to share that with other people. And it took me years. It took me years to realize. And I believe uh, this experience here at this conference was one big uh, time that God kind of took the scales off my eyes and showed me that it's because missions and evangelism, it really is an overflow of a life in love with Christ. And I was kind of doing it all wrong because what I was trying to do was engineer it from inside. If I wanted it enough or this was what I was supposed to do or people were calling me to do. But instead... I didn't realize that, man, this love for God, this deep love for God, that was going to be what was going to fuel my ability to evangelize and be willing to go wherever God was calling me to go. And I could manufacture that on my own, but the reality, it wouldn't last long. It would always go away at some point, and I'd be right back at square one. And maybe this is something that you guys experience. Maybe it's a place that you're in right now. But as I truly, I think the reality is as I truly get to know Jesus and I know his character, I really experience, I experience his grace and his mercy. I believe that fuels from my love for Christ, that fuels my love for him. And that in turn will fuel my love for others. And that in turn will fuel what I'm willing to do for them. And it just kind of works in this perfect equation. So in the next few minutes, I wanted to ask you this question. What does it look like to, to truly and genuinely love Jesus? What does that look like? Well, I believe, you know, there's so many answers. There's so many answers to that, but I wanted to focus in on one answer to that. And I believe genuinely loving Jesus is the willingness to give up everything because you already have it all. It's the willingness to give up anything because you already have everything in God. You know, I believe we see this in Scripture. This is in Matthew chapter 13. I want to point you to this story. There's a story we're going to dive into. It's actually a parable. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, I encourage you to. We'll also have it up here on the screen. You know, if you get a chance to read Matthew chapter 13, it's, it's a collection of parables. Jesus is teaching through these parables. And parables were stories. They were stories that Jesus told. And it was uh, something he did quite often. And he spoke in parables because I think for all of us, we can relate to story, right? I know for me, a lot of times I hear story that connects me to scripture. It helps me re to remember it, to retain it. And so Jesus knew this. So he spoke in these stories. And these stories were usually centered around things uh, that people were very, uh, just were able to identify with. It was very common to them. And he also spoke in parables because he was able to share info very quickly, but it still had these deep spiritual truths to it. And so as we look at this, this is one, it's only one verse long, but I believe there's so much going on here in this verse. So we'll read Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It says this, 
The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, if you guys can uh, just make note of that word, in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has. Make note of that as well. He sells all that he has and he buys that field. You know, I believe here in this parable, we see a man, you just imagine it, right? He's walking through this field, very unaware of what's going on, but he stumbles upon something. And when he sees it, immediately he knows the value. He sees that this is special. He sees that what he has found here is worth more than anything he physically owns. And so he buries it. He hides it. And then we see him going. He heads back into town. And I think the thing you notice is that with joy, he doesn't do this because he's forced to or because he has to, but with joy, he takes everything that he has, all his possessions, and he sells them. And I can just imagine uh, this mental picture. He goes in, he's selling it, and people who know him, maybe even people who don't, they might think he's crazy. They might think, what are you doing? Why are you selling everything that you have to buy a field, to buy this field that's out in the middle of nowhere? Why would you possibly do that? It makes no sense to them. But this man, in his heart, he smiles because he's 100% certain, 100% certain of what he's doing, that he's making the right choice. And he smiles inside because he knows that he has found something that's worth losing everything for, that's worth giving everything up for. To him, it's, it's a simple equation. It's like trading an ounce of trash for a ton of diamonds. It's a no-brainer. And I think that's because Jesus is someone worth losing everything for. That's the reality, is that he's worth losing everything for. You hear this, this unnamed man, and what is he telling us just in this one verse? But he's crying out over all these voices that we hear every day. You know, we listen to the media. They're spending billions and billions of dollars telling us that we always need something, right? That we need something to be complete. They're telling us that we need to get this possession or we need this position in life. They're telling us that, you know, we need to have ambition. We need to achieve things. They even tell us you need to be in this relationship to have worth. That's what's going to make your life worthwhile. But th- Jesus is telling us here, don't buy that. Don't buy that. That is not true. That is something that they're force feeding you. My word says something different. He's saying Jesus alone is worthy of your life, and he's worthy giving everything up for him. And this love, I mean, to to the outside world, it can seem super irrational, right? If you see this on the surface, you're like, no, that's not true. You You need this, you need this, you need this, and you can have Jesus as well. But they all have to come together. And the world may question our thinking and the decisions that we make because it doesn't make sense in their economy, but it makes perfect sense in God's economy. I think it's maybe think about, think about some loved ones in your life and it's amazing what you're willing to do for the people that you love. Sometimes things that are irrational, that people would deem irrational. And I've I've gotten to know this in a deeper level over the last eight or nine months. Uh, Many of you guys know I was married uh, last year, last September. Um, My wife Sarah and I are very much newlyweds. I believe we have a picture uh, of of our ceremony there. Pastor Gary was officiating and uh, you know, I, I see, you know, as Ephesians 5 calls us, he gives us this role of a husband and trying to really live this out and love my wife in this way, but to love her, uh, to protect her, uh, to, to cherish her. And I think it's brought out some of the, the best love qualities I've ever had in my life. But that's on one side. But on the flip side, I never realized how deeply selfish I was until I was married. I, you know, I always thought, oh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty gracious guy. I'm a pretty giving guy. But in the context of this marriage, I realized, man, how selfish and how my needs usually come first and how a lot of times I'm fighting that to keep it down. And I saw this just in a simple story. This was actually just this past Friday night. So I get home. It's been a long week. We've been preparing for Illuminate, all the different uh, just ways to support that we've been putting together, you know, working on the message here. And so I, you know, I've been out here for nine, ten hours. I get home. I, you know, I have some dinner with my wife, and I just want to veg out. I want to watch some TV and just kind of focus in. I'm watching Sports Center, catching up on, on the NBA playoffs. And so I'm really focused in on this. And my wife's in the kitchen, and she's baking. And so she's baking. A couple minutes in, I just hear this noise. <laughs> And she fires up this mixer, right? So she's mixing the batter. And it's so irritating because I can't hear the TV. I'm trying to watch this show and I'm super into it. And so, you know, automatically I'm slightly irritated. And I'm like, okay, I'll just pause my show. I'm waiting. I'm like, how long can she possibly mix the batter? Not long. It's actually a lot longer than you think. Um, but eventually she shuts it off. So I'm watching my show again. A couple minutes later. Argh! 
and she fires that thing up again. I don't think she has any clue how loud this is, but I just feel this irritation. I'm like, man, I've worked all day, honey. I just want to watch this show. Do you, in my mind, I'm thinking this, do you have to do that right now? So I pause the show again. I wait for her to stop. This happens one, two, three more times. And I, each time it happens, I just feel myself getting angrier and more and more irritated. And so what do you think I did? Do you think I went in there and I, I kindly said, honey, can you just you know, stop doing that or I'm trying to watch this show? No, like any good man, I took my emotions and I just buried them very deep. I didn't say a word and I watched into the bedroom. I turned off the show in the living room and I watched it in the bedroom where it was much quieter. And as I'm watching my show, I'm going through this, this mental battle because in my mind, I know I'm wrong. I know how I feel is not rational, but the things I want are coming to the surface. And what I didn't tell you, my wife was baking. You know what she was baking for? She was baking for the bake sale here to support the missionaries. That's what she was doing. So well done, missions pastor here preaching. While your wife was trying to support and care for other people after she worked all day, you know, I was putting my needs first. And I just see this selfishness that comes up that really affects my decision making. I think in comparison, that's maybe where we are sometimes with God. You know, our selfishness, our self-preservation, our motives kick in, and it keeps us from caring for people in the manner in which God wants us to. But I also think on the flip side, there's also this intense love that I have for my wife that sometimes I, I've never felt before because when she's hurting, I want to protect her. I want to help her. When she's in need, I want to meet that need the best that I can. And I know I can't meet every need she has. Only God can do that. But it doesn't stop me from feeling it and wanting to in some way. I really look at it as like, it's almost this blank check type of love. Where if you guys have seen a check, right, someone gives it to you, it's blank, you fill in the amount. That's the kind of love I, it feels like I have for her. It's, hey, here it is, honey, you fill it out. And maybe many of you have experienced this love. It's not just a love between a husband and a wife, but maybe that's the love you have for your kids, right? You look at your kids like, man, there is nothing I wouldn't do for this child. Nothing I wouldn't do. Even if it was irrational, even if it didn't make sense, I would do that for them. Maybe it's a family member or a friend. That's the kind of love you have. It's a blank check type of love. But I believe as followers of Christ, we have sacrificed the right to determine the direction of our lives. God is asking for a no strings attached, blank check type of love for him. And this means that our plans, uh, our possessions, our bank accounts, you know, where we live, our lifestyle, our future, our dreams, our ambitions are in his hands. They're not in our hands anymore. That we are giving that to God. We are handing that over to him. That's the kind of love that he's asking for. Not a love that comes uh, with restrictions, but a love that's just willing. God, we'll, I'll do whatever you want. Just like that man in the field, he sold everything he had because he knew what he had was better. And as we release these things, it may seem scary, right? Because we're giving up control, but it's also with this reassurance, this is in the best hands. What I'm giving away, what I'm getting back in return is worth so much more. You know, Jason, when he was up here, he was sharing that there was this, this perspective shift for him. That, you know, he would look at his life and think, what are my plans? What am I supposed to do with my life? And you're including God in that. So all of a sudden, switching that's been, God, I know what your plan is. It's very clear, laid out in the word of God, that your heart is to care for other people, that your heart is to make disciples of all nations. And so Jason asked, how, God, how can I be a part of that? And as soon as he opened up that door, God provided opportunities. He provided, they were there all of a sudden. And he's stepping into those opportunities now. You know, I think, you know, how do we evangelize to people we don't even know? Our, our, our lifeguard evangelism team actually went out yesterday with some other volunteers from the church. Uh, it was the Armed Forces Day Parade yesterday. And each year they take that opportunity uh, to, to spread the gospel with hundreds, sometimes thousands of people out there. They pass out American flags and they pass out gospel tracts. And how do you have this motivation to head out there with perfect strangers and pass these out and spend the day out there? How do you have the motivation to do that? And I think that's because you have the motivation because you love Jesus. And when you love Jesus, you love other people. And you want to be able to share that. You know, I think it's how people give up everything uh, to be short-term or long-term missionaries. Because to be honest, missionary work is hard. And it's hard for so many reasons. I can understand why people pause sometimes when these opportunities for trips or even to be out there long-term come up. Uh, to, because, to be honest, you're going somewhere. You don't know the culture. Uh, you may not know the language. The conditions of the land are, are a crapshoot. You don't know where you're going, if it's third world or whatever that may be. You may not know anybody. 
the government may not allow you to even share the gospel and the people that you're actually sharing it with, it might seem like it's falling on deaf ears, like it's not making a difference at all. And to top it all off, there's the possibility, depending on where you go, that you might be persecuted and that you might even potentially lose your life. Now, how is that appealing to anybody to sign up for something like that? But I would say, you know, the places that the gospel needs to go now, all the easy places are taken And so the places that are left where the gospel needs to go, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be challenging, and it's not something that we're intrinsically being motivated to do on our own, because all the mission trips to the Hawaii or the Caribbean are taken. There's no unreached people groups there. You know, all the places left are very difficult. But I would say that, you know, this love for God, it drives us to do crazy things, things that we wouldn't normally choose to do. And that's why we see some of our missionaries heading to Uganda, which is a difficult country, very much third world, dealing with people who are really suffering, but having a heart to help them out. It's why we're going to spiritually dead places like Japan and East Asia, because the risks and the conditions are worth it. Because we give up anything for Christ just to tell God, hey, use me, use me no matter the cost. And this last thing I want to share with with you today, church, is just as we really boil it down, missions and evangelism is an overflow of a life in love for Christ. That's what it is. And we realize not everyone here you know, can go. Not everyone here is called to go overseas. And that I understand that. And that is totally true. But I think the thing that is true for each and every person here in this room today is that we are all called to love other people. We are all called to love other people. And we need to ask ourselves, what does that look like, God? How can I love the people around me that you put in my life? You know, as I was sitting there in 2015 listening to this message, I remember David Platt right at the end kind of closing uh, with a statement. You know, something I wrote down in my journal. I, I have it written down at home. And he said, selfless love for others springs forth from supreme love for Jesus. And I think, man, there's so much truth to that. Selfless love for others springs forth from supreme love for Jesus. And so, church, I ask you one more time. You know, do you truly and deeply love Jesus? And I think if the answer to that question is yes, you'll be like that man, that unnamed man in Matthew chapter 13, who when he saw something that he knew was of such great worth, he was willing to get rid of everything and give up anything that he had just so he could have that one thing. And I think if we can answer that question, we'll be just like that man. That when God provides the call, whatever that may be, maybe here in Torrance, maybe in Japan, maybe in overseas, maybe a country we never even thought of, that we're willing to give it up and go because we have that supreme love for Christ and we have that supreme love for other people. Let me close in prayer. Father, we, uh, we thank you for, for weekends like this. Lord. We, we realize that, you know, the call to share the gospel, it's not just a one weekend thing. And even though we get a chance to, to really put that in the spotlight, Lord, that is something you call us to every minute of every day, Father. Uh, to come with a life that is available to you, that is willing to go no matter the cost, no matter willing to do whatever it is that you're calling us to do, Father. But we know that, Father, that's not something that we can generate on our own. That's not something we can pull ourselves up by the bootstraps that we can will ourselves to. That's something that comes just as an outpouring of the love that you pour into us, Lord. And so, Father, before we even start down this road, I ask that we would each ask ourselves that question, Lord, do do I truly love you? And does that motivate, does that power, does that fuel the things that I do in my life? And if it's not, how do I get back to you, Lord? How do I experience you in that way where I know you and I can feel your love and your mercy and your grace in my life, that we would lean into that and let that be, let that fuel the things that we do. Father, we thank you for these uh, 30 plus people that are going out. We know these people are just representatives of a church that loves you. Uh, For each person that's going out, there's dozens, maybe even hundreds of people that are supporting them financially, that are praying for them, that are training them, that are encouraging them, Father, because that's the body of Christ in motion. Let us be a part of that and ask how we can play a part in that process. We love you, Father. We praise you. We pray all these things in your precious name.